Well, good evening and welcome to Calvary Chapel Chino Valley. Wasn't that just an amazing time of worship tonight? And what a great place to be able to pit stop during the week, to be refreshed spiritually and to be encouraged in the Lord. And even through the time of worship, it's such a great opportunity to turn our attention off of our problems and onto the Lord who takes care of those problems. And tonight we have a very special night of just having me here with you. I'm just kidding. Uh, but we're going to have a, another night where we're getting together to study God's Word. And I know for those of you that know my brother Brennan, uh, he is, uh, I would say, the, the best Beeler brother, and you get second best tonight. And, uh, and I, I am playing the sympathy card so that you like what I have to say this evening, so don't uh, say, oh, too much. But we are very, very blessed to be able to be in a place where we can come and study God's Word. Right now, with all the crazy that's happening in the world. Uh, there is such a, a, a huge relief. I, I, I think that it's a relief to be able to open the Word of God and to know where you stand spiritually, to know that God is still on the throne, that God's ways, though they can be very beyond our understanding at times, that they always end up being the best, and they always end up being the right thing to do. And so when the world is flip-flopping on what is right and what is wrong, we know exactly where we stand because we hold on to the Word of God. And tonight, one of the things that we're going to be looking at this evening, and I think that this is something that the Lord's been doing in my life personally, and so this message is very personal to me, but it has to do with how the Lord uses difficulties and pain and suffering so that his righteous work may be accomplished in your life. And so I'm just going to say right off the bat, if any of you are having a difficult time, if any of you are questioning God's love and faithfulness to you, then you are at the right place at the right time tonight, because the Lord has a very special, I believe, encouraging word for you. And so if you have your Bibles, would you please open up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1? We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 tonight, and like I said, this is a, a very, very personal, personal thing to me, and I think that it is going to be used in a way, hopefully, as the Holy Spirit leads uh, the teaching of His Word to minister to you in your time of need. So let's go ahead and pray, and we'll ask the Lord to bless this evening. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. We thank you, Lord for this place that we can call our church home. We thank you for Pastor David and for Marie. We thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness to you. Lord, I believe it was just 40 years now, just not too long ago, they celebrated their 40 years of serving faithfully. And Lord, we thank you for them. We pray that you bless this time uh, of rest, that they be refreshed and just Lord, really just refresh them, not only just in their spirit, Lord, but help their bodies, their minds, everything to, to just be ministered to by you, to feel, Lord, completely refreshed in every area of their life. Bless them, Lord, and bring them back home uh, safely. Lord, we ask that now for us here that you would add your blessing to the reading and to the study of your word. And so, Lord, give us ears to hear what your spirit would say. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, looking at verses 1 through 5 this evening, beginning in verse 1, it says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you have goals in your life, and they could look a, a, a million different ways, but if you're a goal-oriented person, one thing that you'll notice is that you will find yourself bumping into people that share those common goals. And you'll find yourself you know, in the same lane of people that are going in the same direction that you're going in. For these three men that we're reading of tonight, they were actually really good friends. Uh, men that were called to the same calling, to teach the Word of God, to preach the gospel, and to equip the saints. And as a follower of Jesus, we're all to be about the work of the ministry in some way, shape, or form. But there are some that make it their life's work. There are some that their occupation in life, their, their sole calling is to be about the Father's business. Now, this doesn't mean that one calling is better than the other, or for each is given a measure of faith. We all are doing, hopefully, what we're supposed to be doing. But 
when it comes to the preaching of the Word of God and the planting of churches and the teaching of the Scriptures, uh, there is a very special bond that is forged you know, yesterday, I actually saw your pastor as well as many others that were at Kay Smith's memorial service, and we were celebrating her life, and really, it seemed like it was the end of an era, as it will be eight years ago in October that Pastor Chuck passed away, and then Kay, you know, just a few weeks back in, in August, passed away, and what a dynamic couple they were, how the Lord used them to touch a generation. And I remember, you know, being on staff at Calvary Costa Mesa when I was a young man. I was 24 when I went on staff there. And uh, I was able to serve there for nearly, nearly 10 years. But I remember one Sunday afternoon, after uh, Sunday services were over, it was about 1.30 in the afternoon or so, and Pastor Chuck had this old blue Cadillac. If you ever visited Calvary or saw him, if maybe when he had come to visit and you saw his car, this old school Cadillac, and it was it, it was it was a it was a it was a great car. But I remember we pulled out of the the parking lot by the the gas station, the Shell gas station there, and it was on Fairview and Sunflower. And at the time, I had a Chevy Silverado truck. And I, I pulled up next to them, and, and Chuck and Kay were at the light, and I kind of motioned. I rolled my window down, and I said hi, and I motioned to them, and, and Kay looked at me, and I said in a very serious voice, I said, hey, you want to race? And uh, she goes, she says, oh, you naughty boy, like that, in her, in, her, in her real sweet granny voice. And then as soon as that light turned green, Chuck floored it off the line. I mean, in the, in the Cadillac, like, you know, the big V8 engine is, it just went poof, right off the line. And, I, and I'll never forget that. And there's countless stories, you know, that people can share about just really who they were as people. And, and then the kinds of people that they attracted and that wanted to be around them. And those that, even including Pastor David Rosales, who's on, on the Calvary Chapel Association's board of directors. And just this group of men that were called to lead a movement. Uh, there's a very special bond that takes place with these guys, especially in the ones that we're looking at tonight where their lives, their lives were on the line for the sake of the gospel. You know, and there's really nothing like the foxholes of, of life to bring people closer together. And for the, a minister, though, a pastor, a leader, for someone to fall into sin, as we see and hear time and time again, that it just breaks your heart when these things happen. But for a, a minister to err or to fall into sin is to forfeit everything. And the longer you're in ministry, the greater the collateral damage can become. And just like a family, the more kids that you have and the more things you acquire, the greater the loss is when sin gets involved. And the lasting consequences of sin are really not to be underestimated for they fulfill the promises of the scriptures where it says in Galatians 6, 8, he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now, maybe there are some of you here this evening that have gone through some pretty serious things. Maybe you're currently going through some pretty serious situations. And as you go through these serious times of life and your family or your friends or there are those that may come alongside you or that might try to help you through those things. And it brings, if you have not yet noticed already, going through those difficult times not only brings a lot of strain upon you, but it can also bring a great amount of strain upon your relationships, your marriage your children. But after going through those things, the things that were the hardest things of your life, over and over and over, you walk through them, you push through them, you find that those that were closest to you, that stuck with you through all of that, are the ones that you have the strongest relationships with. Often, even in our marriages, I think, as a side note, we fail to realize that the adversity that we face as married couples is the very crucible for a lasting marriage. But in the context of our teaching tonight, there's nothing like risking your life for the most important cause, which is to see people come to know Jesus that will bring you together. That which costs the most 
That which costs the most and requires the most is really what I have found the very knife, if you will, to cut away the things that are not important and that will slow you down. What we do for the Lord, how we live our life, Because we've all come to a point, and maybe some of you actually are not there yet, but I think for those of us as we get older, you come to a point in your life where you realize you have this major epiphany that life is just really short. It's real short. And maybe I feel it a little bit more so today because of the memorial that I went to yesterday, but I think we come to a point in our maturity where we realize, man, life is really short. I don't have a lot of time. And you'll find that as you realize that life is so short that you start to value things that maybe you didn't value previously, things that you took for granted. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you start to place more of an emphasis on the things that you do for the Lord that last. And so Paul and Silas, as he's also known as in Timothy, were men that put their lives on the line for the sake of others, both that were outside of the church and those that were inside of it as well. These men were very remarkable men, and they understood each other. They understood the kinds of spiritual warfare that would take place. They understood each other in the situations of life and ministry. You know, it's sort of like, you know, if you're a bearded man and you see another bearded guy, you just automatically get each other. Like I see this guy right here. I'm like, hey, what's up, brother? How you doing? You got a beard? And you, you give each other the nod. Yeah, I understand. I see you. You know, for those of you that have kids, you know, do you remember what it was like before you had children and how you had something called a social life and and you did things with other people and then you had children and then you started to see that, you know, your social life was kind of non-existent. But then you started to have interactions again with your friends, but your friends didn't have children yet, but you did. Do you remember what it was like and how stressful it was when you had to preface everything that your children did to your friends that didn't have children? And how, you, oh, that's just what kids do. You know, kids will scream and kids throw stuff on the floor and they make a big mess. And yep, you know, I got to change diapers. You know, this is what happens in real life. And your friends are almost like, oh, I don't think I can ever have kids. And then they have children. You know, and then all of a sudden you start hanging out with your friends that have children. You make new friends because your old friends ditched you. And then you have, oh, I've made friends with, with people that have a lot of children. And then you go to share with them like, hey, I'm really sorry. My kids jump off the walls sometimes. And they're like, hey, I have four kids. I get it. I understand what children do. I understand that kids can behave like that. See, in the ministry, it's the same way. You don't have to preface anything because you just understand it. You're dealing with, as a pastor, the same things that pastors are dealing with across the country. You know, I'm involved with a a a once-a-month meeting with these uh, pastors that are in our our Calvary Chapel movement. And, you know, it's remarkable whether they're in the Midwest or over in, in the U.K. or wherever they may be, that when they share their stories of the things that they're dealing with, they're just the same straight across the board. But you deal with that, too? No way. I thought I was the only one. But see, as a follower of Jesus, you have that same connection, too, with your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a strong connection there because some Christians are afraid to admit that they're having a hard time, that they struggle here and there, or sometimes that they actually struggle a lot. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Peter writes and says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. And in verse, verses 8 and 9 of 1 Peter 5, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Listen to this. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So you're not the anomaly. You're not the the random weird one that's having those kind of difficulties. The Bible actually says that the things that you experience as a Christian man or a woman here is being experienced by other Christian men and women around the world because we have the same adversary, the devil, who is roaring. He is that lion looking for whom he may devour. 
And as we get into this letter to the Thessalonians, I think we'll see this unpacked in a way that is very personal and very practical to all of us today. Paul writes, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you, peace to you. Have you noticed how much the world is looking for grace and peace today? Some, something to fill that void? We're all looking for that. We're all looking for it. You know, there's an old school, you know, band by the name of Eurythmics that, you know, wrote that song that, you know, they traveled the world in the seven seas and everybody's looking for something. But the interesting thing is, is that for the Christian, we have what everyone's looking for. We have it. The deception comes to the church when the devil can get us to believe that there's something else out there besides what Christ has given us that will fill that void that we think we may have. We have peace through Christ. Grace and peace, Paul writes, both of them are from God. You will find that grace does not come from good deeds, from kindness, or from love. You will not find peace from money or possessions or relationships. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. There are so many things in our country right now that we can be afraid of in our state, in our county, in our cities, in our neighborhoods. The fear of the unknown. Now listen, there can be temporal peace that you can find in a relationship that's going well. There can be temporal financial peace from a bank account that actually has money in it, but it's not that peace that comes from God. Your relationships that are healthy, that's not the peace that comes from the Lord. Though you might say, Lord, thank you for blessing my relationships. Having money in the bank is not the peace that comes from the Lord. Though you might thank God that he's provided for you financially. See, the peace that Jesus gives kicks in when there is zero in the bank account. And when you feel alone, there his presence is felt. That is the peace that comes from the Lord. It's a supernatural peace. This grace that Paul writes about that we've heard a million times in Calvary chapels, really God has given us joy and pleasure and delight, sweetness, charm, loveliness, goodwill, favor, and loving kindness. He has shown all of those things, all which we do not deserve. That's grace. The peace that we have, we are exempt from the havoc of spiritual war. I'm not against God. I'm not an enemy of the Lord. I have been forgiven of my sins. I have security. I have safety. I have tranquility through salvation that comes from Christ alone. And so I fear nothing from God, nor do I fear anything in this world. And so here's where we get to the nitty-gritty of this passage. It's in verse 3. Paul writes, and he says to the church in Thessalonica, he says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Paul's bound to be thankful. This is actually a very strong verse, though we might lose the strength of it in the English language. This is a very strong statement Paul is making here in verse 3 because he leads off with this word bound. Bound. Which means to be bound by debt, or if we put a modern day spin on it, to owe someone big time. Owe someone a terrible debt. See, what an answer to prayer this was. This answer to Paul's prayer is the same prayer that is prayed for you guys here at Calvary Chapel of the Chino Valley. That your faith would grow exceedingly and that your love towards each other would abound. So Paul says, Lord, I owe you so much for the work that you have done. 
this tremendous work that you have accomplished in the Thessalonians' life, Lord, thank you so very much. You know, when you see someone thriving and growing spiritually, it is such a special thing that you can't help but give thanks to the Lord and realize what a blessing that is. For those of us that have children, to see them walking with the Lord, we thank God for them, especially in the world today. Maybe you have kids that are not walking with the Lord and it's grieving to your heart. And when you see somebody change or you see someone where the spiritual light turns on and they take ownership of their relationship with the Lord, you can't help but thank God. You can't help but thank the Lord. You know, years ago, and kind of where I cut my teeth after growing up as a, as a kid at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, where my mom was pregnant with me when she started going to church there. And so I was in utero singing, the Lord bless thee. And then to grow up in the church and to eventually, you know, go on staff there as a pastor uh, for you know, maybe eight or nine years or so, I can't remember now, but I, I had the privilege of teaching the Monday night Bible study. And every Monday night, I would get up and say, good evening, and welcome to Monday Night's Live in the Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa. And it, would, it was on K-Wave. And I remember this one particular couple came up to me after service, and every Monday night, we'd give an invitation for people to receive Jesus. And this particular couple came forward and gave their life to the Lord. And I met them after service. And they said, you know, we've been living together as boyfriend and girlfriend. And we know that God has called us to not do that. And we're going to get married. We know that the Lord wants us. We're on the same page spiritually. I'm just like blown away. I'm thinking about this now. And I remember exactly where we were in the sanctuary there. And, and, uh, and so they did what was right. They didn't live together. They got married. And, you know, fast forward seven or eight years, you know, they started attending our church and they started, they had a family. They have a, like a beautiful, you know, little baby boy. And so anyway, we, we go out to lunch and this was last year or so. And he's sitting at the table across from me and he starts telling me all of the things that God has spoken to him and what the Bible says about this, that, and the other thing. And my mouth had just hit the floor. And I couldn't help but thank God in my heart. I thought, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, so much for what you've done in this person's life. How he's sitting there now telling me what the Bible says. And I was like, who is this guy? This is amazing. And you can't help but thank the Lord. And when you see those that are closest to you, maybe friends that you grew up with or family members that were like, man, they're so far gone, there's no way. And the Lord reaches them. You can't help but just step back in amazement and think, Lord, only you can change somebody's life like that. And so when Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica, what happened, and you can read about this in the book of Acts, but he planted this church really quickly, and because of persecution, he had to leave a baby church there. And not only that, this church endured terrible tribulations, terrible difficulties. If you look at the two main answers to prayer that were manifested in that church's life that Paul thanked for, it was their faith grew exceedingly and their love towards each other abounded. Both of those things, your faith growing and your love for those next to you abounding can only be brought about by the Lord. I can't do that by myself. I cannot personally cause my faith to grow or my love for you to grow. I mean, seriously, are you kidding me right now? If you were to think that your love is going to abound more and more towards people, if it's left up to you, is hilarious. Absolutely not. I feel like the only thing that would abound, for me anyway, with people around me, is annoyance. Man, these people bug me. You know, they rub me the wrong way. In my flesh, I'm like, who are these people? I'm not going to abound in supernatural love for those people that are around me. This is an actual work of the Lord where I love people. I'm not just talking about you're cool and you kind of are nice to everyone. I'm talking about you have a supernatural love for other people, even for people that mistreat you or that are not nice or that might even rub you the wrong way. You love them. Do you think you can cause your faith to grow exceedingly? I would say again, absolutely not. 
And the reason for that, and this, this is the area that really hit close to home for me. We, by our very nature, as human beings, our physical nature, we take the path of least resistance, always. What's the easiest way out? Nature does it. Nature will take the path of least resistance. I'll go from high pressure to low pressure or whatever it might be. I, I, I will move in a way that is the easiest. And so when Paul says that this church's faith was strengthened, he understood what brought that about. See, faith, which maybe all of us tonight would love to say, I'm a man or a woman of faith. I have faith. It is only strengthened through hardships and trials and testings and breakings. But thanks be to God who alone is all wise, who knows the limits of our faith and does not allow us to be tested beyond that which we're able to bear. See, this church, this Thessalonian church was planted by Paul on his second missionary journey. As I mentioned earlier, you can read about it and you actually can find it in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. But Paul was not there long. He was forced to leave town, a baby church with baby Christians. And it would seem from what we understand of this church that they experienced many tribulations which actually caused vigorous spiritual growth. You know, I've yet to see anyone grow spiritually without resistance. I have never seen anyone grow spiritually without facing some sort of resistance. You know, for those of you that might like exercising, maybe at the beginning of the year you started your New Year's resolution, you were going to lift some weights or whatever it might be. You're going to exercise. So you start off with your two pounders and you're doing curls. Eh, it's really hard, painful process. But then you move to the fives and then to the tens and then to the fifteens and then the twenties and then you skip the twenty fives and go straight to the thirties. And you're like, who is this person? She's an animal. <laughs> what does the number on the weight indicate? It's the amount of resistance. The greater the resistance, the greater the gains. You don't grow without resistance. You don't grow without adversity. You don't grow spiritually in your faith or even as the Thessalonian church was described as their gro faith grew exceedingly. You don't grow without something coming against you. And some of you tonight may be experiencing great hardship or great resistance. You might even feel that the weight that you are bearing is more than you can handle. I don't know how much longer I can do this. Might I just encourage you tonight that the Lord is on the throne and that he is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And furthermore, let us not grow weary in doing good for in due season you shall reap if you do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. When everything in the world is telling you you need to shut down, remember Deuteronomy 24, for the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to save you. And so their faith and their love grew and even overflowed. And that was an answer to Paul's prayer for the church. And that answer, that answer to Paul's prayer, his prayer found in 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 3, which he says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention you of, our, of you in our prayers Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. The church, they worked out their faith. They loved when it was laborious, and they waited patiently as they hoped in the Lord. And so for us tonight, those three things still apply to us. Working, laboring, and waiting are the key components in the process of transformation that takes place in our life as faith, love, and hope are refined. 
In Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, it says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When I read of this church in Thessalonica, I thought to myself, wow, what a great church. They experienced all kinds of problems and difficulties and attacks against them, but what were, what were the byproducts? Their, their faith grew exceedingly and their love for each other abounded. But before we go wishing that we're like them, you know, with growing faith and overflowing love, look at what verse 4 says, which describes the methods through which their faith and love were drawn out. Paul writes, So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. That you endure. This was the church that faced many persecutions and many tribulations. Since the beginning of the church, until the day Jesus comes to take his church home, there will never be a church that has faced persecutions or tribulations that will not come through purified and powered for righteous living. There is not one of you who endures tribulations or persecutions that will not come out refined that will not come out more like Jesus and less like you. And the whole key to this, which I think is perfectly summarized in verse 5, where he says, this is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Now, I don't know if you've read these verses recently or if you've studied this passage or, or, or if you are very familiar with this or this is the first time you've heard it. But if you read these verses together, it is mind boggling. Even as a pastor. I was like, wait a second, you mean to tell me that the difficulties, the resistance, the persecutions, the tribulations were actually the righteous hand of God in making that church strong? How does that work itself out? Because personally, I must confess that when I'm suffering, the last thing that I want to do is be patient, and the last thing that I want to think is that this is God's righteous handiwork in my life. It just doesn't make sense. Because it's when I'm suffering, isn't it true? If you're suffering, isn't it the time where God feels so far away and that he's even turned a deaf ear to your prayers? Just be honest. If you're having a hard time and you're crying out to God and you're not seeing anything change and you're having to endure this day in and day out, it doesn't feel like God is with you. Honestly, the devil's right there in your ear, no doubt, saying, yeah, God doesn't care about you. If he did, why would he allow you to suffer? Why would you be experiencing these difficulties? Why is he not answering your prayers? And then we begin to question God's love and his righteousness. And the reason why we do that is that is, be, that is exactly the reason we question God's love and righteousness is because that is exactly what our sinful nature thinks. My sinful nature does not like difficulty. My sinful nature does not like being patient during trials. And yet it would seem that God's righteous judgment begins in his own house as he purifies and sanctifies those that are called by his name. And you know, it wasn't too long ago, and this is why I said this was personal to me, that I was really struggling. I was having a hard time with these situations that I was faced with. I just felt like it was too much for me to bear. 
I know that might be a little surreal having a pastor say such a thing, but I'm telling you, there just the, the, the pressures that I was feeling, it just seemed like it was too much. And I was hurting. I was struggling. I really felt that it was too much for me to bear the stuff that was happening with church and things that were coming against my family and all this kind of thing that I was working through and trying to process in light of the truth of God's word, but then this real-time experience that I was having. And I'll never forget it. I was standing in my living room, facing the couch. My wife, Ruth, was just on the other side, and I was just venting saying, I don't know how we can do this. This is just, I, I don't get this. Why does this keep happening? You know, is, it, is God hearing our prayer? And I'm having these conversations. And immediately, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I don't know why it was timed in the way that it was timed like that. But as I was listing off all of these things that were like challenge after challenge, after problem, after difficulty, after resistance, after you know, persecution, after all these things that I just like, I, I can't even, I don't even know how to handle this. The Holy Spirit in a still small voice told me all of these things. Every one of those things that you've just listed off, I am using in your life so that my perfect work would be accomplished in you. I mean, I still get goosebumps on it, uh, you know, on my arms because of this, and I and I'm thinking about this because it's so poignant, still, so vivid, still. And I was reminded. Do you remember when Saul? before his name was changed to Paul, how he was on the road to Damascus persecuting Christians. Do you remember that? And then Jesus met him in that bright shining light and knocked him off his horse. And he couldn't see anything, but he could hear. And he said, Saul, why, Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And then he says, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, when I was a kid, I thought goads was just the funniest word. I don't know why. I'm like, what is a goad? And how do you kick against it? That's a weird thing to say until I remember Pastor Chuck explaining that. That, you know, if you were a farmer and you were plowing your field, you would hook your oxen up to your yoke. And in the front of your yoke, which would be the back of the oxen, were these long, spiky little sticks. And that if the oxen was going to be a stubborn ox and not do what the farmer was directing him to do. And the, the ox decided that he was going to buck the system, if you will, that he would get a little pointed reminder of, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. That's not right. And I felt in my heart that things that I had listed off that were my problems and my, you know, woe is me moments, I was rejecting those things as God's righteous handiwork in my life. No, I reject that. No, I'm not having that. No, I'm not enduring that. No, I'm not going to handle that. No, I'm not going through that. And in essence, what I was doing was kicking against the goats. I was rebelling against the very thing that the Lord was using to have his perfect work accomplished in me. And so guess what? It may not be the same for you, but my situations have not changed. But I'll tell you who's changed. Me. Often we'll pray, Lord, change the situation of the person. And often it's the case that the Lord just changes the person in the situation. And I immediately found peace there. I felt that the peace that I had not had, that joy of the Lord that I felt had been a, a fleeting memory returned to me instantly when I re, was reminded by the Lord through this passage that the tribulations, 
the difficulties, the things that you don't like, the things that you wish you could change, the things that you don't want to have to handle, that you don't want to have to deal with or endure, are actually the righteous hand of God at work in your life. And so this work of sanctification, this painful process of patiently enduring, And the refining of one's faith is all a work of a righteous God. But honestly, if we're to be honest with ourselves, even as I am being honest with you tonight, there is there in your heart that question. But why, Lord? Why am I having to do this? Why am I having to wrestle with this? Why am I struggling? Why am I broken? Why am I having such a very hard time? Well, are you truly a child of God? Then you'll understand that if you desire to live a godly life, you will face persecution. And that persecution will be used by a righteous, loving God to make you greater and stronger than you could have ever imagined being. And as you wait on the Lord patiently, He renews your strength. As you keep the faith during persecutions and tribulations, you receive strength that just doesn't run out, but endures. Endures. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit and even having his own experiences to draw upon, took the exact opposite stance to how we feel when we're suffering. I... I, Honestly, I was going, how can somebody write these things? Because typically, and don't get me wrong, I'm not questioning God's word, but I'm just thinking, how can somebody have this perspective that I feel like I'm lacking? Typically, we feel that God has abandoned us when we're hurting. But Paul states that our suffering is evidence of the righteous work of God making us more like his son, Jesus. My flesh doesn't like that. My mind doesn't like to think along those lines. My friend David Guzik said this, and I quote, where suffering is coupled with righteous endurance, God's work is done, end of quote. And so we find ourselves counted worthy of Jesus when we endure suffering and when we push through trials. In the early days of the church, the disciples were being persecuted and they were treated terribly. And after they were released, they said in Acts 5.41 that they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now, I wish with all of my heart that my faith would be able to increase and that I would be more like Jesus without experiencing suffering. I wish that could be the case. But what I've seen is that suffering is the very instrument of God's grace at work in our lives. Suffering, actually, whether you realize this or not, helps us overcome sin. Suffering actually helps us to be less like our sinful nature and more like the Lord. And it's during the times of crushings and perplexities and exhaustion that we find are also the times of the greatest spiritual growth. Because growth is a byproduct of resistance. Now, in conclusion, I'm going to share with you from 1 Peter 4, verse 1, that says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, how many of you here tonight have ever suffered in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, all of us. I'm sure that there's probably, given the size of this audience tonight, that there are some of you that have gone through things that you thought was going to be the end of you. That you didn't think you were going to make it out. That this would be the very thing that destroyed you. When we read of Peter writing that he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin and is like Christ, that is something that we need to take ownership of in our own lives. Because here's the reality. 
even for Christians in the church today. We do not like to suffer. We do not want our flesh to suffer. It's not like, hey, can I get sign-ups for your flesh to suffer? You know, I mean, none of us are going to be like, yeah, sign me up for that. So the reality is, is straight across the board, we don't want our flesh to suffer. And that's me as a Christian. Also, what you will find is that even as Christians, we will find that there are times or areas of our life where we do not want to deny the lusts of our flesh. I don't want to deny the lust of my flesh. We don't like suffering. I mean, some of you may be suffering sitting through this Bible study tonight. I don't know. And it's hard for you. And you're pushing through. Good job. I mean, some of you, you know, on a different note, you know, maybe you've tried to cut out sugar from your diet. I mean, have you ever tried to do that? I mean, if you ever want to find out why somebody's in a bad mood, just by cutting out sugar, huh? I stopped drinking sodas, huh? Because you just become like this raving maniac, you know? It's like, ah, what's wrong with you, man? No sugar. Your body craves it. See, the reality is if we deny our flesh, our flesh will be very angry that we're not feeding it. I don't want my flesh to suffer. I don't want to feel uncomfortable. I don't want to have difficulty. I don't want to have trials. I don't want to have these persecutions. And like I've shared with you, I have truly come to this place personally where I've recognized that there are so many layers of our sinful life that we're not even aware that they're there until suffering takes place. I didn't know that was in me. I didn't know that I struggled like that. And then once the Holy Spirit puts his finger upon an area of our life that needs to change, it becomes very uncomfortable. Oh, it's kind of getting hot in here. You know, I, I don't like this. And the Holy Spirit's convicting you. This is wrong. This needs to change. This has to go. I don't like it, Lord. I just want it to stop. When we suffer... Listen to me, please, carefully, because this is so crucial to what we're studying tonight. When we suffer, we have to understand that it is our sinful nature that is suffering. When you go through trials and testings and tribulations and persecutions, it will not be that your spiritual man will suffer, but it will always be that our flesh suffers. I don't like this. I don't want this. Because if you actually take a step back and you think about this according to what we know of God's word and even your own personal experiences, that your spiritual man has nowhere to go but to increase in strength and power. As your flesh does not like it, as you feel like you're getting beaten down, the spiritual man is getting strengthened. How do you think Paul can write in 2 Corinthians 12.10 and say, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. All of the things that he listed off were things that caused your physical nature, your sinful nature to become weak. But Paul recognized that every one of those challenges that he faced, every one of those problems that he endured, every one of those things that made him feel uncomfortable, that were not pleasurable, that he did not like, and that were hurtful, he found were the very things, the catalyst, if you will, for spiritual growth, power was there in the Lord. And it's in the weakness of our flesh that we find that we're spiritually strong in the spirit. I would even say this on a personal note, that in the weakness of Garrett, I find that I'm spiritually strong in Jesus. And the suffering in my flesh leads us to cease from sin. And you might think, well, how does that work exactly? Well, listen, when you're denying the lusts of the flesh, it's painful. I really want to do that. When you're going through a trial, it's painful. But guess what? 
Do you realize that when you're resisting the lusts of the flesh that you're not giving in to sin? So that's an area of your life that you are not sinning in. That temptation that's there and, the, and the, the way that you want to act in the flesh and give in to the lust or act in a way that's not pleasing to the Lord and you say, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not going there. You're ceasing from sin in that area. You're not giving in to it. Yes, it's a real pain. No, you don't like it. But listen, if you're suffering in your flesh, you're ceasing from disobedience to the Lord. You're walking righteously as your flesh is hurting. And that's how Paul wrote in Galatians 5.24 that those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Being crucified does not feel good. And as your flesh is suffering, your spiritual man can be thriving. And that's a work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And my final thoughts on this is that we rely so much upon our physical senses to discern spiritual things, but they are incapable of discerning such things. How do I feel? What do I see? What do I hear? And we think that those senses are able to discern spiritual things. Paul says the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. And so tonight, as a follower of Jesus, take heart that God is working a mighty work in your life through the things that you don't like the most. And it has nothing to do with how you feel about it. The Lord's there. And as you walk through those fiery trials, Jesus is with you. He'll lead you through the refiner's fire to the other end, and you'll come out worthy of the name you bear, Jesus. And so hold on to that. God's not done. He hasn't abandoned you. He has heard your prayers. And he's doing a great and righteous work through those things that you don't like. And so instead of kicking against the goads and saying, no, I reject it, no, nope, not having it, say, Lord, if this is how you choose to work in my life so that your perfect work may be accomplished in it, then I submit to that. And you'll find the joy comes back. You'll find supernatural peace will be there and grace. And you'll be thanking God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for giving us such a fine example of a church that endured great tribulations and persecutions, and those were the very things that caused their faith to grow exceedingly and for their love towards each other to abound. Lord, I pray that you would give us a greater love for those around us. And maybe even as we walk through our own trials, Lord, we would be more empathetic towards others that may be going through difficult times as well. Lord, it's really true that even throughout history, we've seen that some of the greatest bonds are forged through great difficulty. Where we walk through our trials together as we encourage one another to fight the good fight and to run our race and to finish the course. And so, Lord, I pray specifically for this church, Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, and for every person that might be wrestling with something tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them. Lord, that these things would be used so that your perfect work may be accomplished in their life. And so fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. May their faith grow exceedingly. May their love abound. And I ask these things in Jesus' name.